This is a story wreathed in myth and in mystery. How did a tribe of wandering nomads engineer the greatest empire of the ancient New World in under 200 years? They had to devise engineering systems which were extraordinary for their age. Their civilization rivaled Rome in its sophistication. The Aztecs had the best technology that could be produced in the conditions of which they live. Aqueducts, palaces, pyramids, and temples to honor the gods all stood as testament to the skill and prowess and imagination of this astonishing people. The Aztecs' crowning achievement was a gleaming capital city that astonished the European explorers who found it, calling it the Venice of the New World. The city spread out, glittering against its canals and its lake, bedecked with fine trees and beautiful mansions. But an overwhelming thirst for power and blood set them on a course for destruction. When it finally came, the annihilation would be swifter and more complete than the ancient world had ever witnessed. Thirteen twenty five AD, Central Mexico, near present day Mexico City. A young girl, just a teenager, is celebrating her impending wedding. She is the daughter of a tribal king, and she's about to be married into a new tribe that has been a guest of her kingdom. That tribe is now known as the Aztecs. As part of the ritual, five Aztec noblemen lead her to a temple to perform the ceremony. But as she reaches the top, the noblemen suddenly steer her away from the altar and onto a stone slab in front of the temple, one used for ritual sacrifice. Each man holds a limb while a fifth lifts an obsidian knife high in the air. With one searing move, he slashes her through the chest and extracts her still beating heart. That evening, her father, the king, is invited to a ceremony to celebrate the marriage. Instead, he finds a priest performing a dance, wearing the still wet and glistening skin of his daughter. As part of the ritual, the Aztecs had flayed her in honor of the god of fertility. He saw this, and it was absolutely horrified at what he saw, his dear daughter. And so he and his forces immediately chased the, the Aztecs into the lake and onto this island where they sought refuge. The marshy island was a bleak and inhospitable place. Yet from here, the Aztecs would succeed against all the odds and go on to forge the most powerful empire of the Americas. Hi, I'm Peter Weller. When I think of the Aztecs, I think of an elegant people with beautiful skin and flamboyant headdresses of many colors, and I think of floating cities and a terrific song by Neil Young about Montezuma and Cortez. But I also think of knives, of obsidian glass ripping into chest cavities and hands, pulling out bleeding hearts and holding them high. Most of the Aztec sacrifices were performed in a temple atop a stone pyramid like this one. The Aztecs felt that without these offerings, the sun would literally cease to rise and the universe would die. Now, Aztec history is a fusion of fact and myth. But what we do know is that this murder, as horrific as it was, not only marked the beginning of the Aztec Empire, it also marked the location from where it would rise. The island to which the Aztecs were banished after their disastrous sacrifice of the princess was situated in Lake Texcoco, the largest of five interconnected lakes filling a vast valley 70 miles long. Today, this once enormous open valley teems with the inhabitants of the modern city of Mexico, one of the largest metropolitan areas in the world. 
But 700 years ago, the island was so boggy, no one bothered to lay claim to it. Now, as they gazed on the lake, the Aztec leader, Tenoch, announced to his followers that he had seen an eagle perched on a cactus in the middle of the lake, a sign from the heavens that they had found their new home. They would name their city Tenochtitlan. Life was very hard for the Aztecs in the early days of Tenochtitlan, but they had a vision, a vision of a powerful city modeled on an ancient and legendary city 25 miles distant. This city was Teotihuacan, or City of the Gods. We know very little about Teotihuacan because all we have is the archaeological remains. We don't have any writing, we don't have any documentation that, that really fleshes out what went on at this big city. The metropolis was in ruins, even in Aztec times, but it was believed to be the hunting ground of the gods and the literal birthplace of the sun itself. The place the Aztecs most revered in Teotihuacan was a pyramid that rose high above the tree line. This was the Pyramid of the Sun. The massive monument contains a million cubic yards of earth and stone, and its base measures almost exactly the same dimensions as the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. The Aztecs believed Teotihuacan was laid out in the image of the cosmos created by the gods. It was this image they would attempt to replicate in the construction of their new city, Tenochtitlan. Taking on the challenge was an Aztec leader called Acamapichtli. In 1376, he embarked on an ambitious plan to construct a city at Tenochtitlan. But there was a huge problem. The swampy islands that they took over needed a lot of work. When they started to build anything, it would begin to subside. There was simply no hard ground on which to build. The Aztecs' radical solution to the problem would revolutionize the architecture of the Americas. They began by anchoring their buildings deep in the ground using a system of wooden piles. Workers cut stakes into 30-foot lengths, three to four inches wide. These were driven into the soft ground vertically to form a foundation. The piles were usually surrounded with volcanic stone to add strength. Masons and bricklayers could then erect walls on top of this base, confident they would not sink. They have found wooden pylons to hold the foundations of the, of the pyramids. The fact that they didn't sink or the fact that it didn't just topple, I think that's a major feat of engineering. Tenochtitlan was an island city, but the lakes surrounding it were very shallow, sometimes only seven feet deep. The whole thing looked like a giant metroplex floating on a pond. Originally, the only way to get from this floating city to the mainland was by boat. But the Aztecs eventually devised a series of causeways, sometimes 45 feet wide, that would connect their floating city to the mainland provinces. The causeway was supported by strong wooden pilings, the same pilings that supported their temples and other buildings. Thousands of these pilings had to be driven deep into the lake bed, and this presented a logistical challenge that could only be met by a strong, skilled labor force and the best of Mesoamerica's engineers. To build a causeway, two lines of stakes were set in place. The space between them was filled with stones and earth until the road base was several feet above the level of the water. This, when compacted, allowed the road to support enormous weight. And these causeways were built very straight, uh, they were very wide, with bridges that would open up uh, that connected the city to the north, to the west, and to the south. The roads permitted the transport of larger, heavier building materials, but this in itself presented a new challenge. There were no beasts of burden in Mesoamerica, so everything had to be done with humans. No carts, no wheel. Small loads were carried on the back, held in place by a rope hung from the forehead. Large items like stone blocks or sculptures for a temple would be dragged by huge numbers of men pulling them on ropes, probably using logs as rollers. Legend has it that one stone bound for a temple required a force of 50,000 men to drag it from the mountains on the mainland, across the causeway and into the city. 
the causeways also offered a new way to get fresh water to Tenochtitlan. In the past, the Aztecs had transported water in canoes from the shore of the lake. But a huge rise in the city's population meant they needed a better method to keep up with demand. They wanted to use water from the springs on the mainland, and so they wanted to build an aqueduct. But the springs were under the control of the dominant tribe in the region, the ruthless Tepanecs. The Tepanecs were the controllers or the dominators of all the valley. They had a, a, a very strong empire. So they were the lords of the valley. So the Aztecs were tributary subjects to them. As the Aztecs increased in power and number, tension between them and the Tepanec community started to fester. The Aztecs decided to issue an ultimatum that would change the balance of power. The people of Tenochtitlan not only demanded that the Tepanecs give them the water, but also demanded that they help construct the aqueduct. The Tepanecs' response was swift. Their king, Maxtla, sent assassins to murder the reigning Aztec leader in cold blood. This was the last straw. After decades of oppression, the Aztecs finally made their move and embarked on all-out war against their overlords. And after victory, they would launch a series of wildly ambitious building projects around their growing island city that would secure their reputation as the greatest engineers of the Americas. In 1428, the Aztecs declared war on their overlords, a warlike tribe called the Tepanecs. But in order to defeat the enemy, they needed the support of their neighbors. The Aztecs approached the nearby city-state of Texcoco. There, a new ruler was in the ascendant. His name was Nezual Coyotl, and his charismatic leadership would be instrumental in the creation of the Aztec Empire. With Nezual Coyotl as their chief ally, the Aztec underdogs decided to go for the jugular. They launched a ferocious attack on the Tepanec capital. After a siege of over a hundred days, they broke through the Tepanec defenses and slaughtered their oppressors. The Tepanec king, Maxtla, was captured. His heart was cut out and his blood sprinkled into the waters of Lake Texcoco. Suddenly, the tables had turned. That is the exact moment of the beginning of the empire and the Aztecs became the leaders of the Valley of Mexico. After conquering the Valley of Mexico, the Aztecs could devote their full attention to bringing clean water to their growing metropolis. Remarkably, the Aztecs independently conceived and built something that only a few world empires ever mastered, the art of the aqueduct. The Aztec aqueduct actually had two channels, each about five feet high and three feet wide. One was cleaned and maintained while the other was being used, so the water flow was never interrupted. The twin channel aqueduct extended over three miles from the mainland to the center of the island city. In the town center, water streamed into public fountains and reservoirs and was distributed to the general public or transported to outlying areas by canoe. In comparison to the Europeans, the Aztec were a very clean people. We know that the Aztec emperor bathed twice a day, so in terms of hygiene, the Aztec people uh, was much more advanced than the Europeans. While Aztec aristocrats were bathing in luxury, at this time in Europe, plague, exacerbated by unsanitary conditions, was killing millions of people. King Nezualcoyotl's own bath was unique in the Americas. It was fed by a sophisticated aqueduct system that also brought running water to irrigate his palace grounds. Behind me is the hill of Tezcozinco. And on this hill, Nezuwa Kyoto built a fantastic pleasure palace. And around this palace, a virtual botanical garden filled with all of the exotic flowers of Mesoamerica. 
Nezawak Kyoto brought water from the Sierra Nevada mountains all the way down to here, into this hill, to his palace, just to water his plants. To supply the aqueduct with water, Nezual Coyotl had to fill a huge gorge between Tezcozinco and the next hill. As the water arrived at the first hill, it gathered in small stone pools designed to control the speed of the flow before it reached the aqueduct. After crossing the aqueduct, the water ran along a circuit around Tezcozinco Hill, spilling over the sides down rock-cut channels in order to water the gardens below. It ended up in an almost perfectly circular rock-cut pool called the King's Bath. And from here, he could look upon his domain at Texcoco, and he could look down at the botanical gardens that he was watering with his fantastic aqueducts. It is indeed a bath fit for a king. By the mid-15th century, the empire being firmly established, it was time for the Aztecs to choose a sovereign leader. He was called Moctezuma, and he would be the first of two emperors to bear this now famous name. Moctezuma's first priority was to extend the empire's borders. The Aztecs captured city-states southward to the valley of Oaxaca, westward to the Pacific, and east toward the Gulf of Mexico. By 1449, the empire contained 15 million people. In the short span of only a hundred years, the Aztecs accomplished the almost impossible. They toppled the Mesoamerican world order. But while the Aztecs dominated the landscape militarily, their island city was vulnerable to a different kind of enemy. Like New Orleans, Tenochtitlan was constantly waging a battle against flooding. And one of Moctezuma's first projects was to protect his city from the potential deluge surrounding it. This is what is left of Lake Xochimilco, in the southern part of Mexico City in Aztec times, the city of Tenochtitlan. This lake, like the other four lakes that surrounded the city, were spring-fed. Thus, there were no rivers or streams into which it could drain. And if it rained hard enough, the water would rise up and sweep over the land and into the city itself. And this is exactly what happened in the mid-1400s when a flood of catastrophic proportions swept into Tenochtitlan. The city and the empire it commanded were almost completely destroyed, and the Aztec civilization had to once again rely upon the genius of its engineers, and one engineer in particular. Moctezuma enlisted the help of his old friend Nezualcoyotl to protect the city he intended to reclaim from the lake. Nezualcoyotl would devise a solution that would make his reputation as the greatest engineer on the continent. His plan was to create a secure zone around the city by digging a huge dike and fortification system that would safeguard Tenochtitlan and its inhabitants. It was intended to be larger than any earthwork anywhere in the Americas at the time, running for 10 miles east of the city from the southern edge of the lake up to the north. The walls were a wickerwork construction made of sticks, reeds, stone and soil. Since the lake was shallow, the dike was only 12 feet in height, but it was 27 feet wide. Nezualcoyotl fitted the dike with sluice gates, probably made of wood, that could be raised or lowered to control the water level behind them. The dike also served another purpose. It protected the water supply. It was important to build some sort of protective mechanism to keep salt water out of the freshwater western part of the lake. An army marches on its stomach, so said Napoleon. Now an ample food supply for civilians is a no-brainer in the critical development of any civilization. But the Aztecs perfected a unique method, not only to provide a substantial food supply for its civilian populace, but to fuel the military expansion of its empire. This revolutionary engineering feat was called chinampas, a system that allowed the Aztecs to literally create new land to farm and to live on. If you're going to have a city of any size, you have to provide room for them. And so what they did was build up these chinampas in the lake bed. 
basically Ichinampa is an artificial island built in the lake. They looked like narrow football pitches, about 300 feet long by about 30 feet wide. Echinampa was created by weaving a web of sticks which floated in the water and piling reeds on top of the sticks. Mud was then scraped from the lake bottom and piled on top of the reeds. It took four to six men eight days to construct the average Chinampa. They were connected to the city by navigable canals that took 8,000 men 50 days to build. A chinampa like this one could produce up to seven crops a year, whereas a farm on the mainland could yield one, maybe two, maybe three at the most. As a crop was ready to harvest on a chinampa, seedlings from another would be sprouting out of mud that would be spread on a boat adjacent to the chinampa. Then when the seedlings were ready, they'd be transported to the chinampa, and this cycle would be repeated over and over and over again on hundreds and then thousands of chinampas. Now, it was this technology that transformed Tenochtitlan from just another tribal town in the 14th century to a dominant and thriving city-state. Today, Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire, is gone, buried under present-day Mexico City. But 700 years ago, it was a shining metropolis of growing prosperity and confidence, built by advanced engineers and led by mercurial emperors. By the late 15th century, the Aztec population had risen sharply. Their next great emperor would launch a series of brilliant conquests to rival anything in world history. His name was Awizotl, and he would prove to be an even greater warrior than his grandfather, Moctezuma. By 1502, Awidzotl had conquered territory from Mexico's Pacific coast and extended the empire as far south as Guatemala. His reign was kind of like a golden age. He was a king that opened up transport routes to the coastal areas and to lowland areas where the Aztecs got their greatest luxuries, these shimmering tropical feathers, the gold, the precious stones that the, the nobles and rulers wore as symbols of their station in life. To convey riches to the heart of the empire, the Aztecs constructed a network of superhighways throughout central Mexico. Relay runners were stationed every few miles along the roads to create an express postal service. Messages or goods could be sent 200 miles from the Gulf Coast to Tenochtitlan in just 24 hours. Easily as fast as first-class post today. The power of the empire was at its zenith, and Awizotl embarked on its greatest construction project to date, a massive pyramid at the very center of Tenochtitlan, a symbol of absolute power. It was called the Templo Mayor, or Great Temple. The base of the pyramid was 240 feet deep by 300 feet wide, and it rose to a height of 15 stories. There were 117 steps on two staircases which climbed 200 feet and led to twin temples to honor the gods of rain, and war. The temple was rebuilt on the same site seven times, starting in 1325 when the city was founded. As the empire grew, so did the pyramid. Each new stage was simply built on top of the previous one. The Temple Mayor was built mainly uh, with a stone called Tesontli, that is uh, volcanic stone. It's a very light weight stone that would uh, prevent the sinking of the, of the temple. The Aztecs applied a lime plaster to the walls and floor, which was similar to a form of concrete. Now, 500 years later, some remaining examples of the original plaster are still as rock hard as modern concrete. Aztec workers toiled for years to complete the supreme monument to their gods. The temple remained buried until 1978 when workers digging a trench accidentally uncovered a huge carved stone and discovered the temple ruins next to it. The disk, 11 feet in diameter, weighs eight tons and depicts the dismembered body of the goddess Coyolxauhqui. 
Coyle Shoutkli was the moon goddess, but her brother murdered her because she became pregnant in a very shameful way. Now, the Aztecs weren't prudes by any means. Matter of fact, nobles had many wives and concubines, but amongst the commoners, particularly women, adultery was a no-no and severely punished often by death. So according to legend, the moon goddess's brother cut her head off, and after he decapitated her, he shoved her body down a hill. The Aztecs reenacted this killing literally and frequently in festivals throughout their calendar year. They would decapitate their victims at the top of a pyramid like this, and then push the carcasses down the steps to the great stone at the bottom. For the Romans, the most precious thing on earth was gold. For the Egyptians, it was the afterlife. For the Aztecs, it was human blood. They felt a sense of reciprocity with the gods. So they needed to give a thanksgiving to the gods, giving the most precious thing they had that was human blood. It was called precious water. And it was believed that if the gods didn't receive blood in massive quantities, the world would end in terrifying apocalypse. It was common practice to adorn the walls of the insides of the temples with fresh human blood. And the smell must have been appalling. To dedicate his expansion of the great temple, Emperor Awizotl held a mass sacrifice. The heads of victims were displayed prominently on skull racks around the temple. According to some uh, chronicles, they say that there were sacrificed 20,000 people. From a practical point of view and from a scientific point of view, it sounds impossible. So I think that the chronicle that is written by Spanish sources is basically telling us that to their eyes, they were many. As Awezotl's reign progressed, the bloodletting skyrocketed. Life in Tenochtitlan became an orgy of death. Friends and enemies alike would be brought in to witness the, the sacrifices. It's always ritual sacrifice, it's always a ritual event, but it was also a political statement. And it was a, kind of, a form of intimidation. By the time of Awizotl's death, the Aztecs had institutionalized sacrificial killing and turned death on the battlefield into an art form. The Aztecs were ancient America's fiercest fighters, an elite cadre of whom would have a spectacular new mountainside temple dedicated just to them. But even the most warlike among them were not prepared for the war of the worlds that was about to descend upon all their lives. 1502. Awizotl, emperor of the Aztecs, was dead. Moctezuma II, a 34-year-old former priest, took the reins of power. A world away, in Spain, an 18-year-old notary called Hernan Cortes was preparing to cross the Atlantic to take part in his country's conquest of the New World. This time marked the zenith of the Aztec Empire. It covered at least 80,000 square miles from Tenochtitlan at its center, outwards to both coasts and as far south as Guatemala. Some 25 million people were subject to Aztec rule. 38 provinces comprising many city-states were paying vast tribute to their rulers, which made the emperor, nobility, and priesthood fabulously rich. The city spread out, glittering against its canals and its lake, bedecked with fine trees and beautiful mansions. And Moctezuma II presided over it all. He was renowned for his statesmanship and martial skills. A ruthless leader, he slaughtered the entire population of towns that wouldn't bend to his will. However, in private, he was a troubled man. It seems that Moctezuma was a passive individual, perhaps even a depressive individual. A legend relates that when he witnessed a comet streaking across the skies over Tenochtitlan, he spent the rest of the night in tears. As time went by, he became increasingly paranoid. 
However, at the height of his fixation with the supernatural, a very real threat was fast approaching from across the sea. Lookouts posted along the coast of the Gulf of Mexico reported strange sightings offshore that they were at a loss to describe. They never have seen a boat, so they didn't even have a word to, 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 to describe that. So the Indians referred to those boats as mountains that move in the water. In 1519, after sailing from Cuba, Cortes arrived with 11 of these floating mountains. 500 men and 50 horses landed on the Gulf of Mexico, 200 miles southeast of Tenochtitlan. The Aztec tribesmen were astonished by these creatures wearing metal clothing and the strange animals that they'd never seen before. As Cortes moved inland, the tribes who resisted him were slaughtered, but some others were happy to provide him with provisions and men. One of the ways in which one local lord down on the Gulf Coast curried favor was to give Cortes and his company a group of women who were to not only provide for them in housekeeper sort of manner, but were also clearly meant to be courtesans as well and provide sexual services to them. But among the concubines, one in particular captured the heart of Cortes himself. She was La Malinche and was the daughter of a chieftain who'd been sold into slavery. They developed an intimate relationship, and in time, she bore a son to him. And he would have been one of the first people of mixed blood in the New World. She was much more than a mistress. She became an interpreter for Cortes, and her role evolved to advisor and intermediary between him and Aztec ambassadors. Not only was she his translator, but she could also tell him about things that were being said that he was not intended to hear or understand. Moctezuma's network of relay runners kept him apprised of the Spaniards' movements. It was clear they were headed for his capital city. As Cortes advanced toward Tenochtitlan through the summer of 1519, he amassed an army of thousands of native Indians. Moctezuma's army of warriors numbered hundreds of thousands. They wore animal costumes on the battlefield to intimidate their opponents. Part of it was spectacle. You had just incredible costumes that the different warriors would wear. The most important warriors were knights dressed as jaguars or eagles. The Aztec Knights were initiated into their orders at sacred ceremonies at special temples like this one. This is the Cave Temple at Malinalco, one of six temples on this remote mountainside a few hours south of Mexico City. It was finished by Moctezuma II around 1502, shortly after his coronation. Now, over in Europe, Michelangelo was pounding out the David for the Republic of Florence. But while Michelangelo was carving the David, the Aztecs were here carving this temple right out of the side of this mountain. And it is the only temple in the entire Western Hemisphere built in this manner. At the bottom of the stairs of Kualcali are the sculptures of two jaguars. On each side of the door, there are the remnants of two warriors. Now, the door itself represents the open mouth of a giant serpent. You can literally see its tongue coming out of the room. The Aztecs believed that this was the entrance to the womb of the earth. Now, the privileged warriors would come here, go into the room with sculptures of eagles, have their noses pierced, and offer blood and sacrifice to Huitzilopochtli, the god of war. But this would be by no means the last time these Aztec warriors would spill their blood. The first meeting between Cortes and Moctezuma was civil, but the conquistador knew a huge and bloody clash between the old world and the new was inevitable. He was right, and the annihilation that ensued would become one of the most horrifying episodes in the history of the Americas. Autumn 1519. Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés had finally reached the opulent Aztec capital he'd heard so much about, Tenochtitlan. 
When the Spaniards first saw Tenochtitlan, they thought they were in some kind of an enchanted vision. They thought they'd entered some kind of a dream. A massive force of native warriors allied against the Aztecs accompanied Cortes as he advanced along the main causeway into the city. The meeting of Cortes and Montezuma on a causeway approaching Tenochtitlan had to be one of the most remarkable events in world history. It's really a, a, a meeting of two different worlds. And Cortes offered his hand, but the minute he started to do that, to actually touch Montezuma, the noble attendants around Montezuma pushed Cortes away and said, no, 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 that's, that's a total indignity. Nobody touches Montezuma, the great lord of the land. The meeting of the two worlds was polite, but fraught with tension. Moctezuma by this time had become increasingly impulsive and irrational, and he was given to bouts of hysteria. So the encounter was a, an, an encounter of, of sensing the, the, the forces no, in each side. But the Aztecs had a diplomacy and a warfare system that was somewhat naive in comparison to the very tricky and sly system of the Europeans. Moctezuma invited the Spaniards to stay in one of his palaces. That generous offer would prove a bad mistake. As the conquistadors entered the city, they were so awestruck by its magnificence, many thought they were hallucinating. At the heart of the city stood the Emperor Moctezuma II's colossal palace. It was a massive complex spread over six acres and situated adjacent to the great temple. One of the Spaniards noted that every day at Moctezuma's palace, 600 nobles gathered, and they would hear the word of their emperor. Moctezuma received the Spaniards in a large reception chamber just beyond the main entrance, which was designed to make the emperor appear omnipotent. But Moctezuma's grand palace would be the last ever built by the Aztecs. Not a week into their visit, Cortes cut to the chase. He kidnapped Moctezuma. It was an outrageous act, but it worked. The empire appeared to fall like a ripe plum into his hands. Even though Moctezuma was still the official leader of the city, it was, he was really, for some time, nothing more than a mouthpiece for Cortes. For six months, tensions slowly simmered within the walls of Tenochtitlan. Then, in the spring of 1520, it all came to a head. One morning, Spanish soldiers interrupted a sacred sacrificial ceremony and slaughtered those taking part. The move ignited an uprising. From the Aztec point of view, the Spaniards had committed an unspeakable sacrilege. The city became engulfed in chaos as Aztec citizens marched on Moctezuma's palace. Moctezuma gets up on the top of the palace and tries to talk to the people and calm them down, and by now they're just not having any of it. Moctezuma had become nothing more than a puppet, a betrayal so great in the eyes of his people that they pelted him with rocks and arrows. Shortly afterwards, Moctezuma's lifeless body was tossed from the palace walls. Whether he died at Spanish hands or from injuries inflicted by his own people, may never be known. And the Spaniards at that point decide this would be a, probably a good time to leave the city. On the night of the 30th of June, 1520, Cortes and his men attempted to escape under cover of darkness. But they can't separate themselves from the plunder that they've gotten so far, so they're weighted down with all of the things that they want to take with them. They were easy targets for the Aztec warriors who intercepted them on the causeway. Bodies quickly piled up in the water. 400 Spaniards were killed, along with several thousand of their Indian allies. That escape has, has come to be called the Noche Triste, the sad night. Cortes and a few others managed to escape with their lives. The Spaniards decided they would bring the shining city of Tenochtitlan to its knees. Cortes began by severing the main artery of the city, the aqueduct. 
as hundreds of thousands of people within the city's walls were deprived of water, Cortes created a blockade around Tenochtitlan to cut off all outside supplies of food. So the idea of this uh, blockade was to try to, sur to make surrender the city by hunger. And the Aztecs had a tremendous resistance, so they couldn't be defeated easily. And what they decide to do is to mount a, an attack both by land and by sea. For centuries, the lake around Tenochtitlan had proved an effective barrier against invaders. But Cortes found a way around that. He ordered thousands of his Indian allies to carry the parts of ships which had been dismantled up 13,000 feet over the mountains, there to be reassembled and launched into the lake. May 1521. Cortes unleashed his massive army in a final decisive attack on Tenochtitlan. 600 Spaniards, including 100 cavalry and upwards of 50,000 Indians, clashed with the Aztec defenders of the city on its grand causeways. Savage fighting continued for several months. Day after day, Cortes pulverized the city, street by street, building by building. He and his Indian tribesmen were merciless in their systematic slaughter of the Aztec population. It was an extremely hard-fought battle, especially in the city precincts. They made a last stand at the great temple in Tlatelolco. Warriors lined the steep steps and platforms to rain down arrows and rocks on the enemy. But it was hopeless. On the 13th of August, the final Aztec leader, Cuauhtémoc, was captured, and he surrendered to Cortes. That was only the beginning of the catastrophe. 20 million souls would die of diseases brought in by the Spaniards. By the end of the 16th century, we estimate that the native population had been reduced by about 90%. Present-day Mexico City has been built on top of the rubble of the once majestic city of Tenochtitlan. The Spaniards leveled it for the construction of their own colonial capital even using stones from the great temple to build their Catholic cathedral. It still stands next to the ruins of the temple it displaced. The Aztec Empire vanished, and with it, a legacy of astonishing engineering achievement. It has become clear from their sophisticated systems of urban planning, agriculture, and waterworks that the Aztecs stood among the most advanced of the world's great empires. The cave temple here at Malinalco is one of the few truly impressive Aztec achievements that the Spanish did not destroy. And stunning sights such as this beg the tantalizing question, if the Spanish had not come, what would Mexico look like today? I'm Peter Weller for the History Channel.